Good evening, and welcome to the Bangalore International Center for this lecture by Lalita Kamath titled Wet Histories, Fisher Stories That Reimagine Mumbai's Coast. Can you hear me? The BIC is a space for informed conversation, arts and culture, and you can sign up for our email notifications of our programs on our website. To briefly introduce our speaker, Lalita Kamath is a professor and the chairperson of the Center for Urban Policy and Governance at the School of Habitat Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. An urbanist and planner, she has written on the politics and uneven impacts of urban governance, planning, and infrastructure. Her first book was a co-edited volume titled Participalis, Con Consent and Contention in Neoliberal Urban Governance. Subsequent work has focused on the nature of urban transformations in the global south. Lalita grew up in Bangalore and did her PhD in urban planning and policy from Rutgers University on public-private partnerships as a mode of urban governance, the case of the Bangalore Agenda Task Force. She later worked in a research collaborative in Bangalore on policy advocacy and on the many new pieces of legislation that were coming out at that time, speaking to communities, activists, and government officials. Since 2009, she has been at TIS in Mumbai, where her work has been broadly in three areas, questions of urban indigeneity in Mizoram, issues around migration and placemaking in smaller cities of the Mumbai metropolitan region, such as Vasai Virar, and the project she's going to speak to us about today, which she's been engaged in since 2017, her ethnographic work on fishing communities on Mumbai's east coast to understand changing conceptions of urban climates in habitation and value at the water's edge. This has involved conducting interviews and group discussions with community participation and compiling an archive based on the Fisher documents in the Trombay Fishing Cooperative Society. Members of the community asked for documentation of some of the challenges they face in fishing in the seas of Mumbai. And in response, Lalita spearheaded the team that made a film Sagar Putra, Offspring of the Sea. In all of this work, she is committed to democratizing knowledge production through experimenting with new forms of media, film, electronic media exhibitions, spatial mapping, and storytelling, and working in interdisciplinary teams. I must add that she has just been awarded a Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship <laughs> to be based at the University of Pennsylvania for the next academic year, where she will do comparative work in the US on Delta and Estuarine cities, and cities with creeks or wetlands similar to Mumbai. A quick housekeeping announcement to please make sure your mobile phones are switched off or on silent mode. And with that, over to Lalita Kamat. Thanks so much, Pratiti. Um, that was such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to use it in the future. Um, I'll have you know I sent a bio that was way too academic and boring and I was told sternly that I needed something a bit more interesting. Um, so you've done a fantastic job. Uh, I want to actually begin by saying um, it's a tremendous honor, uh, I'm, and I'm so happy to actually be here in one of the cities that I call home. Um, and not only that, but I'm here to talk about work from another city that I call home, um, so a real privilege. Um, I want to begin by thanking the BIC team. Uh, thank you so much. Vikram, Pratiti, Sandhya, Advaita, and all the rest. Um, really, um, thank you for making this happen. Uh, I was also pushed by a few friends of mine, notably Sid Raja and Keetana Kumar, so I want to thank them uh, for making me do this. Um, I'm going to actually, without 
further ado, um, open my slides. So the talk today is titled Wet Histories, Fisher Stories That Reimagine Mumbai's Coast. Um, and for most of us, coasts mean two things. One, degraded industrial landscapes and polluted water, but also massive coastal transformation, um, usually through big infrastructure projects, sometimes housing projects. Um, and Bombay is no exception to this trend. Interestingly, coasts are also seen as the first sites of impact of changes in climate. Um, they're also seen, interestingly, as potential solutions. And solutions in the sense of not just the fact that coastal ecologies can provide uh, protection of different sorts, for example, mangroves as, as buffers, but also potential solutions in terms of the knowledge that coastal communities have. Uh, and I'm particularly going to focus my talk today on fisher communities uh, who possess enormous knowledge uh, of living amidst wetness. Yet interestingly, India's first urban climate action plan uh, was done in Mumbai, and it was inaugurated in 2022. Now, Mumbai is seen as one of the most um, uh, endangered cities um, to, the, to various impacts of climate change. It's number two in terms of uh, flooding and flood risk. Um, but yet, interestingly, the Mumbai Climate Action Plan actually has no mention of the sea, doesn't talk much about the coast, and has absolutely no mention of fishers or the knowledge that they possess. Um, and so I think the, the work that I've been doing with fishing communities since 2017 has given me, um, has really enriched me in the sense of understanding the vast knowledge um, that fishing communities possess and the different ways of knowing and sensing they have about urban climates. Um, and so I've learned a lot from them about a new imagination for thinking about um, the city and thinking about the coast. And so today what I want to talk about is really how we can reimagine coasts differently based on fisher lived experience and the stories that they tell. So I want to begin by showing you, in fact, uh, some of you might be quite familiar with this map. Um, it's a map of Bombay City uh, from an 1843 plan showing land reclamations from the sea. Um, and if you'll see, um, you'll see the original islands, uh, which are sort of the white dotted portion, which is very few. And there's a huge area in between, which is showing the reclaimed land. Um, and so this is really, in many senses, Mumbai, and not, Mum, not Mumbai alone, but Mumbai is really a city founded on land reclamations from the sea. I'll show you another map, which is a zoom up close uh, of the eastern coast, which is really the Bombay port, the colonial Bombay port. And this map shows also land reclamations from the sea, which were done in the late 18th and the early 19th century. Um, and these, um, I'm sorry, the late 19th and the early 20th century. And owing to these land reclamations, the Mumbai Port, Port Trust today is one of the largest landowners in the city. It owns approximately 1,880 acres, uh, which is approximately one-eighth of the original island city of Mumbai. And you can imagine uh, how much that's worth today. I'll show you a much more recent map, which is in fact showing you which is a little bit of a zoom out, showing you, in fact, the same land of the Bombay port. Uh, but now, in fact, a new coastal imaginary for this space uh, under the rubric of sub broadly what's called the Eastern Waterfront Development Project. And so just to say that the east coast of Mumbai houses both the colonial Bombay port industrial complex, um, but also then a newly revalued Eastern Waterfront Development Project and what we can see through this and the argument that I'm making is really that the eastern coast has really been constructed as a site for furthering first, first British imperial ambitions and then subsequently post-independence Indian nationalist ambitions. Uh, and in the process, they have constructed the east coast as a highly toxic wetland, housing hazardous and high security industries and populations that for the most part live in very poor quality of life and uh, conditions, environmental conditions in particular. Now, given the amount of talk about the degraded industrial landscape 
of the coast, but also simultaneously the great excitement about the great value that um, the coastal land actually holds. In recent years, there's been a lot of these kinds of discussions about how do we unlock Mumbai's coastal real estate. Um, and this picture on the right is really of Atal Setu, or the Maharashtra Trans Harbor Link Road, which connects Mumbai to the uh, Navi Mumbai mainland. Um, this was recently inaugurated in uh, February of this year uh, by the Prime Minister. And this is a picture of it at night lit up. And, um, it caused major traffic jams with people going just to take selfies um, and pose because, and there were all these comments on uh, X about, um, you know, we've really arrived. Look at this incredible um, modern infrastructure. Now these, in fact, these are regional versions of larger national visions such as Sagar Mala, which many of you might have heard of, uh, which is a national imaginary, a national vision for exploiting India's blue economy um, and achieving a blue revolution, a Neel Kranti. Um, so this is a, a plan which basically talks about harnessing about 7,500 kilometers of coastline, 14,500 kilometers of uh, internal waterways. Um, and there's a big plan, not just to modernize India's ports, uh, but also to uh, do a whole series of port connectivity enhancement, port-linked industrialization, connecting coasts to hinterland, and coastal community development. Um, the Jawaharlal Nehru port, which is Mumbai's second port, is very much part of the Sagar Mala project. Um, and what I want to highlight here is really that all our coastal imaginaries to date, both our past ones, our colonial ones, um, which are more industrial, but also the present ones, which are far more focused on real estate, leisure, ecotourism. Both these kinds of coastal imaginaries build on what Mariam Dosal has called, she's a historian who's talked about the rule of property. Now her whole argument about pro this rule of property is really the idea that land and a land-based imagination in some sense is essential to the development um, and to the to in fact the formation of Mumbai as an industrial and commercial metropolis. Um, and this is very much a state-led rule of property because the state has in fact underwritten this whole process by creating a legal structure for how, um, for um, privileging and um, sort of making property the most important relation that we can have with a piece of land. Um, all other relations, social relations, sacred relations are seen as secondary, lesser, and to be devalued. Um, this together with a quote I've given you from Govind Narayan, which is, who's the author of one of the oldest, what's considered perhaps the first urban biography of Mumbai, where he says, is it not an astounding feat to recover the land from the sea and make it habitable and free of disease and earn lakhs of rupees in the process? And so this all goes to what Mathur and Dakuna have talked about as really privileging land over water and privileging the making of property from the sea, um, where they've talked about in order to make property, in order to create value, you then need a landscape of hard edges and distinct entities. You need sharp lines. You can't have a fluid terrain. You can't have fluid occupancies. You can't have changing. Uh, with the seasons or changing with the tides. Um, and so this is really what I want to highlight here in terms of thinking about then the privileging of this land-based, property-based imagination, uh, which is very much something that has marked not only the city's growth, but also the way in which we think about our coast and we harness the sea and coastal terrains, fluid terrains, uh, to drain them and to make them valuable land. Now these spaces, which are underwritten by the draining of wetlands, by the filling up of lakes, they also combine to produce the accumulation of discrimination for particular communities. And that's something that I really want to focus on in this talk. But on the other hand, a lot of the work I've done has really focused on how we still have all these fishing villages of the indigenous fishing community of Mumbai, the Koris, which hug this Thane Creek area 
these, this, which is the old, this is the east coast, the uh, frontier between Mumbai and Navi Mumbai. And these fishing villages, in fact, reveal older, now almost forgotten traditions of inhabiting the coast based on what Mathur has called living amidst wetness. Important to note, both current and past coastal imaginaries cast aside those whose paradigm of habitation is opposed to the singular one of property, such as the fishing community and the fishing uh, fishers of, of, of uh, Koriwadas. And so this work explores stories of the Koriwadas and the Koris, particularly of one Koriwada, Trombe, which is located there. To understand how fishers experience um, the coast and the histories of the coast, how the coast has come to be what it is today, and then also how they seek to reshape coastal imaginaries that they see as deeply unjust. And listening to Fisher experience, I argue, can reveal a very different history of very rich entanglements between land and water, between human and beyond human, that come from living according to a very different rhythm, not the standardized minutes and hours of a clock, but in fact the rhythm that comes from the rising and falling of water and water levels. And this rising and falling water with the tides and with the moon, this informs Kori's relations with sea and land, and these very much go well beyond those solely associated with property relations. So today I'm gonna to focus, I'm gonna tell you two stories from the fishers, and both these stories will talk about how fishers increasingly find themselves estranged from the sea and sea-based livelihoods due to current ways of both imagining and constructing the coasts. These ways of imagining and constructing the coasts hinge on both polluting, but also of making property. But even as many fishers are turning away from the sea and sea-based livelihoods, even as many of them do not want their children to be in fishing any longer, their estrangement, their turning away is marked deeply by struggle. And this struggle is also seen through what I'm calling processes of reclaiming. Now, this is a very different kind of reclamation from what I talked about earlier, and I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. But this kind of reclaiming implies actions that recall the erased past, that build on many of their memories, many of their histories, but in new political acts of making new futures. And I'm going to talk about, um, through my stories, I'm going to highlight some of this. So the term, the first story is really called Remembered Boundaries, Kori new Notions of Home. Now the term Koriwada literally refers to the Kori's village or home. And while te telling stories of their village, many of the older fishers talk of not just where they live, but they talk about where they work, where they play, where they have festivals. So they talk about spaces where they, not just the settlement area, where their houses are, but they talk about the adjoining expanse of seashore lands, of intertidal zones, the marshy chikal. Uh, they talk about the coastal seas where they do fishing. And so for them, their village, in fact, transcends simple land, sea, and workplace residence boundaries to include what they call fishing commons and what has commonly now been come to be known as fishing commons. These lands span land, mangroves, and sea. And how, you might ask, are fishing commons produced? They have, in fact, produced collectively over many years of customary use. So commons are a particular, so th this, this type of land is one which is not based on legal ownership. It's not based on a property relation, but it's based on customary usage of this land for livelihood purpose. So these are lands that they use to park their boats, to mend their nets. Um, these, are bo these are areas of land in which um, they make there are, there are shipbuilding activities happening. So there's a series of different kinds of fishing-related activities that happen. And these, and by repeatedly performing the collective labor of fishing in these spaces, they produce then these common spaces that are imprinted with memories of relations with each other, with fish and other kinds of species, with past activities that they did two years ago. There's a big flood they'll remember. They talk about a particular deity. There's a whole lot of affect and, and emotion, deep emotion, that is imprinted in these spaces. And these spaces span land and sea. And so how the Koliwara, in fact, remembers their village's boundaries 
starkly contrasts with how state agencies mark its official boundaries. And this GIF actually shows the remembered boundary versus what you see at the end of the GIF. The narrow, very tiny official boundary marked by the state as the current settlement boundary. And if you remember, the initial boundary was large, and this is what it is today. So sitting with a group of community elders uh, in, a temp in the temple, we talked about their experience, we listened to their experience of how they felt encircled and enclosed. And they were talking about this as they drew this map and as they mentally talked about, not mentally, as they remembered, corrected each other. It was a process of really interesting process of um, community discussion, collaboration, and piecing together um, their remembered boundary. All the land up to the hill was ours. What is today known as the Baba Atomic Research Center is ours. We gave land to establish the BARC. Government agencies seized our common land because we couldn't prove legal ownership. This was in 1954 when the BARC was formed. So we kept being pushed back and lost a lot of our land. The same BARC that we gave land to, virtually for free, has declared a 500 meter no fishing zone beyond their boundary in the sea in the name of security. They've installed a security boat in the area from where they chase us away. And so the fishers find it deeply ironic that their own land that they gave to the BARC, a big chunk of their commons land, not only do they not have that land today, but they also then are encircled and, and squeezed because in the sea as well, they are restricted. Uh, on the grounds of the BARC security. The Maharashtra government's sale of 25,000 square meters of the Koriwada's common land to the BEST, which is Mumbai's public bus company, for building a bus depot in 1987 is one example of such kind of enclosure, uh, which has in fact greatly shrunk and reduced um, the area that the fishers um, used for their commons and saw as part of their um, livelihood commons. And their struggle against this state-sanctioned enclosure reveals how they use this enclosure as a, itself as a ground for new political action. So I'll explain a little bit about how this has happened, this contestation. So after Indian independence, the government of India assumed stewardship of commonly owned lands. And this was, of course, done with the intent of allocating them for public purpose, for some kind of public interest. But in practice, what this meant is that they often then enclosed the lands. They often privatized these lands. And this is exactly what happened. 25,000 square meters of, the, of, the, of Trombe's common fishing lands were given in 1987 to the transfer to the best. Um, now, a paper trail we have ch chased it all the far way back from the 1960s, reveals the kind of negotiations that fishers in this Koriwada have had with different state departments in order to try and um, establish and consolidate their claim over this land. Because so far it's just common land. It's recognized as their commons, but not legally. And so therefore they are never, they don't ever have sort of uh, the, the solidity um, of legal ownership. And so they do all kinds of things. They have negotiations, uh, they have litigation in the Bombay High Court, they fight an 18-year court battle. But these, effect, uh, these efforts were stymied because Mumbai's property values, as we come into the 90s, are reaching higher and higher. And so the pressure to commodify lands escalates. And so this then results in the sale of 25,000 square meters to best. Now. I might say that this is not an isolated struggle, an isolated case. All across Mumbai, all across, I would say, many cities like this, not just in, in India, but across the world, we are seeing cases where of not just fishing settlements, but different kinds of indigenous uh, uh, communities struggling with these kinds of issues of how do you actually lay claim onto common lands that one has traditionally used for centuries? So. I want to, in fact, say that 
what the fishers then do through their struggle is they actually reveal how they use this enclosure itself as a ground for new political struggle. So what they do is they seek to recast the very meaning of enclosure through an everyday practice that I call embodied because it uses their own bodies. So what they do is they persistently use this disputed land, which is now legally owned by the West, in varied ways. And so, for example, they use it for their retail fish market. They use it for a drying yard. Um, this is a picture of the drying yard. This is a, one of the women, the Zaula dryers, who throws the Zaula to dry every day and collects it um, after a couple of hours of baking in the sun. This is what the ground turns to in the evening as a playground for children. And this is, in fact, uh, a picture of the Trombekori festival. Um, so since 2017, they've been actually having festivals to visibilize their Koriwara, to talk about their culture, to talk about their traditions, about their commons, about their recipes, about their fish, and to attract people to come to this place and to see um, what their Koriwara is about, how much it has contributed um, to the history of the city. Now, what's interesting about these everyday embodied practices is that they are shaped by the rhythms of the local ecology that guide the kind of fishing that they do, which is very much small-scale fishing, what's called artisanal fishing. And so fishers measure time in the rise and the fall of water, not by standardized minutes and hours, as I mentioned earlier. And so this temporality of fishing is connected to temporality in land use. And it allows, therefore, the fishing commons to be occupied and used by different groups at different points in the day. And so what we've done is, in fact, we've tracked how this space changes in the midst of the day, through the course of the day, and then also through the course of seasons. Um, I don't have pictures to show you of every, every change, but it's really interesting uh, to see how early morning, when the fish comes in, the space is empty, then it becomes a wholesale market, then it becomes a retail market, then you have fish drying happening. Then you have the second cycle of fish driving. First one in the morning, second one in the afternoon. Then it becomes um, a playground. And you have all kinds of uh, games being played. In the late evening, it becomes strolls, picnics from neighboring communities. Uh, it, it's a little dark. Uh, during the monsoon, some of it is inundated. Uh, it it's a spongy area. It sort of absorbs water uh, in different ways during uh, different times of the year. Um, and so you can't, so, so they leave it open and then it's used for different things at different times. So it's quite incredible to see the space change. Um, and while nobody has exclusive rights over this space, um, it's legally owned by the best fishers. So I think what's interesting, if I can, oh, sorry. If I can go back to this slide. Um, I want to just point out this picture here. I have numerous pictures here where you'll see the buses coming in and out and the fish market continuing. And the women who sell fish and the jaula dryers will actually tell us that they will not give an inch. So for example, the bus will come within three inches sometimes of where they are sitting. And once we were worried and we asked them, you know, do you want to move a little bit? And they just looked at us and they said, if we move, the bus will take more space. And this is our space. And so there's this, every day there's this constant negotiation. Um, and this is why, in fact, I talk about this as this kind of everyday embodied practice, the ceaseless movements that transgress the official boundary um, of the disputed land, that in fact uh, try to suspend the ownership of this land by the best. And so the Trombe's Kori seek to transform the space of this, of this area, of this fishing commons area, uh, and they seek to also transform the legal property relations that it encodes within it by this constant use. So the best, uh, the Bombay uh, transport uh, company has not actually been able to actualize their ownership even though they legally own this space. And so they have effectively, one can say, suspended the best's ability to practice their ownership rights over this property. So what's interesting to note here, I, and I can answer this, talk about this more in the Q&A if you're interested, that this kind of reclaiming then reveals a greater engagement with state law, but it also serves as an alternative to the dominant model of private ownership and segregated zoning of place. Because as a planner, the first thing we are taught about is how you segregate spaces, 
how you decide some spaces are for residential purposes, some are for commercial purposes, some are for you know, roads and parks, and, and all of these are not supposed to be transgressed or changed or reshaped in other ways. But in our everyday lives, in our everyday practice, we actually see how these are being remade all the time. And so this kind of practice by the Koris is interesting also because it's not led by any one person or any one organization. It's in fact something that's uh, sort of collective action, but by uh, sort of non-collective actors, uh, which is to use a, um, a concept that um, a particular social scientist, Asif Bayat, has used uh, to characterize this kind of process, which doesn't in fact have a very clear leader uh, or any clear directions that are being given to people, but then seems to just happen with its own rhythms. So this was in fact the first story that I wanted to tell you. Um, and I want to now move on to the second story, which is much more now focused on the sea. And the second story is called From Sea Spirits to Oil Terminal, Contesting Peer Pau's Metamorphosis. So this story is really talking much more about seafaring, going in the sea, in boats, Seafaring not only focused on livelihood, but was also imbued and inflected with social and sacred relations. So fishers tell, in fact, about marriages that would take place, how they would travel via the creek for the marriages. So they would depart and return on the high tide, and the marriage would be held between the tides. They talk about how boating in the creek involved taking the blessing of spirits and saints while at sea. So in fact, they talk about Pirpao, which is Somewhere here, you can't see it clearly, but it's actually uh, recorded in the old gazetteers as a shrine, which was right at the tip, uh, as I, where I pointed out. But today, there's no longer any structure. And they argue, in fact, that it's in the water. And that this saint is somebody who blessed them. And because of this saint, which is located in Pirpao, their ancestral deity, resides in the sea and gave them the name. So their village, in fact, is taken from the name of this ancestral deity. So the village name originally was Tumba, they say, which today in Marathi is Turbe, and in English has become anglicized to Trombe. But in 1922, Peer Pau was colonized by the Bombay port as an offshore berth for handling petroleum, oil, and lubricants products that were transported by global oil companies like Burma Shell and Esso. So imperial designs very much, but not just imperial post-independence, we see a very similar continuation in terms of nationalist ambitions. So in 1951, soon after acquiring independence, the Indian government approves the establishment of two government-owned oil refineries in Trombe. And one of the reasons I speculate why some of this starts happening much more frequently, and so this is a map, in fact, showing, um, if you look, this is a map showing the undersea pipelines, the oil pipelines. Um, so this is talking about the existing first chemical birth, the proposed second chemical birth. All of these are under underwater, and one reason for that is that over the years, overland cargo traffic, which visibly leaks, and pollutes as it travels on city roads or rail infrastructure, started enraging environmentalists and deeply concerning them. And so there were more and more protests about this kind of pollution that was taking place. And so one of the reasons why the port has increasingly focused on developing pipeline infrastructure, I argue, is because it's buried in the sea, far from prying eyes. And so this kind of offshore POL, or petro petroleum, oil, and lubricants and chemicals, uh, you have a new jetty which was commissioned at Pirpao in 1996 and a second chemical birth in 2016, and no doubt there will be further plans as we go ahead. So I want to show you, in fact, a short clip and excuse the um, shaky hands. This is Pushpa. She's a Kajindar fisher, which is a subsistence fisher, what's called a subsistence fisher, where they use just their hands to uh, catch crabs and nuti from the chick, what they call chikkal, which is this marshy land of the intertidal zone. So we wait till low tide, and then we slither and float in the mangroves 
we were following her, which is why this picture is so shaky. It's incredibly difficult to walk in the mangroves. But she's extremely skilled at it. But if you'll note also, I don't know if you could see, but her hands and the crab also that she pulls out here and ties and puts in her net bag, um, her hands are covered with a kind of dark black kind of muck, chikal. And this dark black color is also a lot due to the kinds of contaminants you find in the mangroves. Um, oil, sewage, uh, and you can smell it strongly, but also glass pieces and a whole range of other kinds of plastic. And, and so fishers like Pushpa are particularly at risk because they just go in with their bare hands and feet, and we did too while we followed her. Um, and many of the fishers don't, especially some of the women, don't actually talk or find an easy language to express uh, bodily harms. Um, and so in fact, what Pushpa would do was she would, she just sort of wordlessly showed us the harms that wrought on her hands and feet uh, by years of wading um, in the contaminated marshland. And so this embodied toxicity is something else that we are trying to think about. How does the body in fact register uh, this kind of contamination? Um, and how can we use it as evidence? Because one of the big problems about working in the east coast of Mumbai alongside the port, uh, in an area which is surrounded by ports and high security industries is that they do not take, um, they do not actually collect or reveal or share pollution data. And it's extremely difficult to enter these spaces. No one is allowed, in fact, uh, no non-fisher is allowed to enter, certainly not researchers or photographers or cinematographers or any, uh, any others who might in fact be taking, be capturing evidence. And so might we then think of the body as a way um, to showcase or, or to, to reveal um, toxicity? Um, and particularly important is because this area is really, one can see these spaces and this is really right next to the Trombe Kodiwara. So these spaces are really like sacrifice zones. Um, the oil benefits many of us, certainly all of us in this room, but many others beyond. Uh, but where, in fact, do the harms and the costs um, of such oil production, refining, um, import, export, where do these fall? And certainly Trombe is one of those, and Pushpa um, is at the forefront of these. So I've talked a little bit about Peer Pau and its metamorphosis into this oil and chemical terminal. Uh, but fishers also are not only just sort of sitting back, they are struggling with how do we, so while they're turning aside from the sea, they're also struggling to think about how can we reclaim and make our claims to the sea. And they do this in a number of different interesting ways, and I want to actually move to this next. Um, materially, fisher infrastructure comprises fishing stakes and nets, what the Koris call saj that are ancestrally handed down from one family to the next. And I want to play a small clip from the film that we made. But the water is filled, the timing is not the same. And the water is filled, 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 and the water is filled, the water is filled, the water is filled, the water is filled. Because the timing is filled, that the water is filled, 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 सज मे एक अपनी ठराविक जागा आती जस आप घर आत तस पया वगैरह मजबूत करूँ अपने एक बिल्डिंग उभारतो तसच आम्मी पे जाऊन तैमे काटी बिटी बधुन तशी बिशी बधुन तैमे रशी बधुन ताऊ मे जागा ती तैयार करते जागे लगे सज बोलता जाली लवतो आती पारंपरिक एक जागा आए कि अभी नहीं कि बाबा तुम्हें दिल आम्मी दिल नहीं ती मे आम पंजाबपासून आजोपर्यंत नंतर वडिलांपासून नंतर आमच्याकडे आलेली आहे सो फिशिंग स्टेक्स ऑफ द कोरीज हॅव इन फॅक्ट बीन रेकॉर्डेड इन मॅप्स डेटिंग व्हेरी फार बॅक सो दिस इज द फ्रायर्स मॅप ऑफ सिक्सटीन सेव्हन्टी टू विच इन फॅक्ट इफ यू कॅन सी हिअर इट्स अ लिटल स्मॉल बट इट्स रिटन हिअर फिशिंग स्टेक्स And there are numerous examples like this. This is probably the oldest map that I could find, but there are numerous examples of maps where fishing stakes have in fact been marked in the sea. Uh, many of them have in fact been removed by the ports 
uh, on the grounds that fish boats need to come in and out. Um, but Cody's have also talked about how um, these stakes, in fact, established their presence in these waters prior to even the city's formation. And their claims to space in the sea are made not just on the political ground of customary livelihood claims, it, as the indigenous art, artisanal fisher, but they also make these claims as taxpaying citizens of the Indian state. And I think this is particularly important to note, uh, because let me show you the next uh, slide. Now, this is from the Gazetteer uh, of Bombay City and Island, and this is showing a, a, a map, uh, sorry, a table uh, talking about items of land revenue from 1727. Now, again, here, if you look, you see the items they've written here. Under miscellaneous, you see Korivadas here and 7,000. Okay, this, this is the denomination of currency at the time. Um, and so what we see here is this is the revenue that was, that was or rather a form of tax that was levied on koris and uh, on every kori for the liberty of fishing and following other, uh, other occupations related broadly to fishing. So this was the head money paid by fishing koris. So um, fishers in fact use this. So on the one hand, they are very aware of how this, these kinds of taxations um, and sort of closures of the sea, the, the move from making the creek and the sea, which was earlier much more open access to them, but closing it down and making them pay a tax for it, they're very aware of what this has done, but they also use it uh, to subvert uh, and to actually make a claim that, hey, we've been paying tax just like every other citizen. So not only are we the artisanal fisher, uh, the Bhumi Putra, but we are also then the taxpaying citizen. And so in, in the, I showed you right at the beginning the Maharashtra Trans Harbor Link Road picture, the Atal Setu picture. So when the Atal Setu was being built, this Kodiwada was in fact one of those that was deeply affected, not on land, but in sea, their Saj was affected. And so they actually argued that we have our Saj, this is our ancestral uh, fishing commons in the sea, and you need to recompense this. And interestingly, they were successful. Uh, it's the first time that I know of that um, the Maharashtra state actually agreed and not just gave them some fairly small and meager compensation, but the fact that they gave them compensation and recognized as such itself is interesting. And so this, the point is really that this is a claim that is not just about the past based on customary livelihood and paying of tax, but this is a, also nested in future-oriented projects. Uh, politically and legally, there have been numerous court cases filed by fishing communities. Um, they've talked a lot about the slow violence done to the environment, to the seas, to the fish, to their livelihoods. Um, they've also, what they, they are specifically enlisting ideas of, which are not typically understood as environmentalism. Koris are not seen as environmentalists. But I argue that this is a form of environmentalism. We need to think of it as that. They enlist not just ideas of environmentalism in these court cases, but they also enlist ideas of regionalism. And perhaps this is to counter a far more overwhelming nationalist Im imaginary for the coast. So this, the kind of regionalism I'm talking about is they articulate these claims of stewardship of the sea, custodianship of the sea, together with ideas of Bhumiputra, which stands for indigeneity, and the idea of the Marathi Manus, or the sons of the soil. And they use these, in fact, to negotiate better access to both coastal lands and access to the sea amidst the ascendance of capitalist land markets. So this, I come to the end of my second story, and I move to my conclusion where I really want to step back a bit and think about what have we learned from this kind of indigenous reclaiming, and to, in fact, contrast it with what I began, which is state-led reclaiming. And so I want to first say that Fisher's reclaiming seeks to draw on and extend an archive of alternative lived histories of inhabiting the coast. And importantly, these foreground um, earlier etymologies of the word reclaiming. So if you look at where does this word come from, reclaiming? What is its history? What is its origin? How was it used? Um, I found it very interesting that the earliest usage that I could find uh, was from the late 15th, 16th centuries, and largely that referred to this idea of protest, a cry of no, the action of claiming something taken away. And so this is really how I argue 
one can see indigenous reclaiming, the act of, in fact, trying to reclaim something that was seen as taken away and to oppose oppressive practices of making property and polluting. And this is in very stark contrast to later meanings of the term reclaiming. Because later meanings of the term reclaiming, particularly in the by the 19th century, reclaiming started being seen much more to do with reclaiming land from the sea and ideas of reclamation. Uh, and in fact, the, the form of the word reclamation is exclusively seen as the state action for improving lands to make them suitable for more intensive use. And this notion is very tied up with 19th century Western liberal notions that in fact were founded on the making of property and valuing pro property above all other relations with land. And so this, I think this sort of this contrasting idea of how do we think about reclaiming and reclamation is something that I want to uh, dwell on a little bit. Um, State-led re reclamations are very often, or I would argue are associated with what Gyan Prakash called a double colonization. And this is a colonization at two levels. First, um, a colonization of people by the, Brit the British of Indians, and the second, the colonization of the sea by the land. And so this uh, notion of a double colonization is important to think about then, because reclaiming and reclamation, the project of reclamation is all about carving up the sea, enclosing the sea through a variety of legal planning and tax regimes. And all of these are supporting a particular form of capitalist urban development. And so Fisher-led reclaiming processes perhaps offer a more just, sustainable Im imaginary for our coastal scapes, since they have not been made through these oppressive histories and practices, but rather they have in fact evolved locally through locally encoded understandings, historicized understandings of justice, of shared usage, and of accountability. So I'm going to end with just a quick note on watery histories, uh, also looking at place names, administrative divisions, and different things. So here I want to actually say in Bombay, and I would say not just in Mumbai, in many cities, um, we need to, there are so many, uh, this, the, the fishers reclaiming um, and their foregrounding of our watery pasts, which are also our watery presence, especially with the uh, climate change looming and the increasing risk of flooding. Uh, what these do is they provide an opportunity for us to remember our own watery pasts and relations. Uh, and maybe this can help us reclaim a different kind of future. Uh, this is just, I put up very briefly, if you look, and this, I've done this for Mumbai, uh, but I think in many cities this might be the case. What is our history with water? Um, Mumbai has very much been founded on making land, making property from the sea, but the sea is also encroaching in, in many ways back uh, through flooding. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of place names, particularly in the island city, are very closely associated with water, with wetness of different sorts. And I've put up there a couple just out of interest, especially if there are those of you here from Bombay. But there are many, many such examples of place names that in fact have deeply watery histories. But it's not just place names. If you actually look at the history of Bombay, even administrative divisions in fact emerge from uh, how water flowed, ingress and egress of water, um, and the topography of the land. So I think in that sense, the ecology was much more closely intertwined with even how administration worked. And finally, even several centuries ago, where water, which areas were low-lying, um, for example, areas like Kamathipura or Nagpara, these areas also were typically those inhabited by poorer, lower caste, lower class people. And this is, I think this is again something that hasn't changed. Um, you see those at most risk uh, for, uh, for, uh, against flooding are all those that belong to these low-lying areas and they are largely uh, or let's say disproportionately inhabited by uh, lower caste and lower class. So I think really then how do we remember our watery past? Um, I had a friend who was telling me that um, in Mumbai, till about 30 or 35 years ago, we used to actually have tied timings in the newspapers every day. Um, but the English newspapers he's talking about, some of the Marathi newspapers still carry tied timings. Um, and so it's a, a sense of how our relation with water has changed so significantly. And this goes well beyond, I think, just 
the notion of property. So I wanted to sort of uh, end with this and maybe put this up there once again to remind everybody, not this is of course for Mumbai, uh, because it was done for largely for coastal cities, but it was a well-known um, projection done in 2019. I don't know how many of you might have seen it, but it, the article which was in the Nature came out in the New York Times, so it got a lot of press, and it really was talking about, so if you see the map on the left, um, it, was the old, it was an older projection of what flooding is going to look like in Mumbai uh, in 2050. And so this article was arguing that those, the, pro the, the projection was in fact uh, uh, underestimation. And so using newer techniques and methodologies, they actually were arguing that this is what the new projection was going to look like for 2050. And if you will see, a lot of Mumbai is actually in, inundated at high tide level. Um, so I think I'm putting this up only to say that um, this work that I've been doing, I believe that we have a lot to learn um, from communities like Fishers, who in fact have been living amidst wetness for many centuries, um, and in fact straddle what I'm calling the two cities of Mumbai that are present today, the city of the sea and the city of property. So I'm going to end there. I hope, you're, I hope you have questions. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, my name is Murlidhar Rao. Recently there was this report about uh, an aircraft landing and uh, flying into a flock of flamingos and a uh, whole lot of them getting massacred and the aircraft are also getting damaged. Now, the flamingos, um, I read some, some time earlier, came onto these, uh, these water bodies mm -hmm. uh, because of the, you know, the water becoming warmer because of the discharges from BARC or something like that, and the flamingos were not there before, they came after that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, flamingos coming to Bombay was a good thing, but then, uh, you know, oh, they, uh, they were brought by the hot water discharge from BARC. Now, so, is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, I was about to say I didn't talk about that, but that's some of my more recent work where we've been looking at the whole creek and how it's changed. One of the uh, things to note there is that so one thing is that flamingo habitats have in fact um, been increasingly squeezed in many parts. So many parts of the, not just the Mumbai, but Mumbai, but the metropolitan region, uh, because of such uh, accelerated development, um, a lot of the wetlands has in fact been disappearing. And so I think we, have been, we are seeing flamingos in different places of, than we used to earlier. So that's one. The second big thing is really the point you're talking about is that flamingos were earlier not seen in Mumbai. And so I've been doing interviews with uh, birders and environmentalists, scientists at, for example, the Bombay Natural History Society. And one of the things they highlight is how till 1994, you, you didn't see actually any big flocks of flamingos. Uh, earlier, they used to be isolated, smaller sightings. But in 94, they saw the first big flock of 30,000 flamingos. And subsequently, now every year, they, they receive upwards of about 150,000 to 170,000 flamingos. Um, so what's interesting about it is there is some, um, one can argue that this is good for some communities. It has energized and revitalized some economies, and some people have benefited, notably those ecotourism, the birder community, environmentalists who have now switched and much more focused on birds and incre increasing studies on birds. On the other hand, a lot of these water birds and definitely flamingos, they thrive or they can thrive in much more polluted waters. Um, and it's not just the heated waters of the BARC, but so the thermal power plant, the, uh, the hot water that they discharge is then becomes a very conducive, um, let's say, habitat or space for um, and there's also huge uh, sewage discharge. So we've been mapping, in fact, the creek is uh, what many of the city engineers, both in colonial times and in the present, call a flush, natural flushing action. So all the, um, all the sewage treatment plants 
and all, pretty much like a big, uh, vast number of the dump sites of not just Mumbai, but Thane and Navi Mumbai are all located in wetlands and around the Thane Creek. So all of these, in fact, contribute to the um, contamination of the creek, which increasingly only or fewer species can tolerate. So while the creek has seen a huge reduction in fish species, crab species, bivalves basically, mudskippers, uh, prawns, but you see, in fact, increased population of birds. So fishers are crying because their livelihood and futures are deeply harmed. But on the other hand, birding communities and new, op new sort of opportunities are arising from ecotourism. But I think we need to remember this is a fairly toxic ecotourism. So there are limits and one might, must think, I think, about this idea of balance in ecosystems. So beyond a certain, anyway, I'll stop here. My name is Malini Ranganathan. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamath. That was such a visually evocative talk, apart from being full of meaning, semantics, and history, um, um, and a beautiful storytelling as well. So my question uh, has to do with the story of the taxation and the tax uh, payment that you showed from the 1700s, which seemed to be a considerable amount, even at the time. Mm -hmm. But how has that played out in contemporary times? So, do they use evidence of payment of taxes, for instance, to claim their rightful belonging at, in, in the common property area, in areas where they're trying, the government is trying to evict them? So what is the sort of political uses of the taxation? And then secondly, on your final slide, showing the very dire projection of sea level rise, it seems that, that the Kolibadas would be actually more prepared, as you said, to deal with sea level rise than us land dwellers, right? Do they ever point at that? Do they ever themselves acknowledge that actually we are the ones who know to live with the sea? Like, do they, do they claim that sort of reputation? Thanks, great questions both. Um, I think in terms of the first, in terms of tax, um, so I'm, I skipped this part because I, I was already sort of uh, going beyond time, but uh, so you have the, during the colonial times they had this Koribara head tax, subsequent to that, you actually had the Indian government charging them. So the C, what was earlier called the Sea Customs Department and then subsequently became Customs and Excise Department used to charge them um, a fee um, for their such. And they paid it, they say, till about 25 years ago when then the payment stopped. They was, they, and so they see this stoppage, in fact, as a deliberate attempt to erase the fact that they actually had not just claim to the sea, but that the government, both colonial and independent Indian government had actually recognized that claim by asking them to pay a tax as a license. So, uh, so in fact, I've been trying to trace, um, yeah, <laughs> but I've been trying to trace some of this and um, it's not very easy uh, to actually trace some of the documents. I'm, I'm sort of working on that. But they have used this claim, in fact, in multiple cases, for example, where there was this big, um, not a cruise ship, but they have these uh, coast guards which come and patrol enormous ships which stay um, in one place for some time and, and really destroy the fishing because they're not allowed to go close by. Or there, are, there were a number of cases like this where they actually uh, made, um, use this evidence to say that we have the right, we have the access and you need to move. But let me say that, you know, in the larger scheme of things, these are very small wins, um, though they are certainly using them. And I think um, to your answer your second question, um, they certainly are aware that they have the more tools and techniques to live uh, with wetness, with rising waters. But I think they are also increasingly clear about moving away from fishing because fishing is just not viable anymore. Um, and there's tremendous sadness, I think, and regret and all kinds of emotions tied up with that, which is why they embark on then these reclaiming processes. They're not willing to give up just passively. But I think the next generation, it's pretty clear that very few of them, in fact, want to remain in fishing. And so I think, you know, it's uh, a lot, we have to recognize the fact that a lot of this knowledge in, is, in fact, already lost and being lost. And this is one of the reasons for this project, is to actually not just value this, but even, in fact, gather it and seek to put it together and see how we can put it in conversation with other, um, other, other bodies of knowledge like 
from fishing communities or from other coastal communities who live with wetness. And this is not just fishers. I mean, for example, if you look at people who live in bastis or informal settlements, they are the ones who live in floodplains. They are the ones who know how to deal with flooding. Every year, they deal with flooding at multiple points in the year. So even that kind of knowledge, I think, is extremely valuable. But how do we build with that? How do we think from this adaptation knowledge is really uh, the work that we are doing in my current project. So. Mira here. And thank you, Lalita. You are reflecting our wetness project, which uh, me and my PhD students and others have been doing. Uh, my question was actually answered partially, but I was talking about the habitation, habit, habit, uh, habitation of these villagers, how, about how they deal with wetness in their homes and what's the relationship to wetness when they want dry land. And you said they deal with flooding. Uh, where, are those wet, uh, where are those habitations situated? Are they situated? Um, because there's a contested land, right? There's all these factories. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about where they're working. But where are their homes? Or are, do they have like temporary homes? Are they living in Mumbai and coming to work? What are they doing? Is it, is it an office for them? Or is, are they living there in that area and working? So thank you so much. Thanks. Um, no, so they're certainly living there. So in fact, what I showed you as the official boundary, that very small boundary which the GIF ended up with, that's in fact the settlement boundary. Which, so the Maharashtra government only recognizes the settlement boundary as the village boundary. Um, and so this, in fact, is the big problem, that it doesn't actually include any of the larger spaces around, which are their commons used for their fishing activities. Um, so they very much live there, but I think it's not just Koris who live there. So this is a small village of about 2,500 Koris in terms of the numbers who are in the fishing registered in the Fishing Cooperative Society. But beyond Koris, there are also migrants who live there. And I'm calling them migrants because that's what they are called commonly. Um, many of them are, uh, and there are different number of different kinds of migrant communities. So you have those who actually are kalashis, who, who are laborers who work in, especially the bigger boats, the trawler boats, uh, who with that go out for 15 days. So this is not a, so much the artisanal fishers, but the bigger boat owners. Uh, there are about 50 of them, 55 of them in Trombay. So there, there are these labor who go out and come back, and so they stay. But there are also other communities. So I think uh, many scholars have been writing about how urban villages in India, in fact, constitute an important uh, rental housing uh, for uh, different kinds of uh, migrant communities, poorer communities. And very much this is the case even with fishing villages. Uh, so the Koriwada has, and this is not just poorer migrants, actually. They also have, they cater to students. So it depends on the uh, what's around them. And so they cater to a number of different um, kinds of um, also classes. Um, of migrants. So I think you have all of these stuffed in a fairly small area and there's tremendous um, construction in the residential settlement and they're going up and up and up because they can't spread. Uh, my name is Anahita. I'm here at, right at the back. Ah, yeah. um, thanks for a fascinating talk. I had two questions. One was on um, the customs, uh, the customary practices that they use. Um, I'm just wondering how this is administered within the community, uh, because of course mm -hmm. the composition of the community is probably changes. People leave or die, or the uh, population mm -hmm. explodes. Um, and whether this, in some way, can translate into state-recognized rights. Um, the second part, and I think it is related, is um, you've talked about uh, the uh, way they have embodied themselves on the land. Uh, in state parlance, that would be E for, not for embodiment, but E for encroachment. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious why when Bombay is rife with stories about removal of the so-called encroachments, uh, how uh, this has not happened here. The state has a lot of might. Why have they not used it? Is it because of the projection of the Kohli's of themselves as Marathi Manus and the political leverage that brings, or are there other reasons? Yeah, I think you've partly answered uh, your own question, the second part of it, uh, certainly. That's a big part. So I think they have been pretty um, well organized and pretty savvy in the ways that they have responded to the state. 
Um, but also, I think we cannot discount the fact that the Kori community publicly, politically, in policy-making circles are very much seen as uh, one of the Aboriginal communities that typically people talk about five of them, but that were there before the city was a city. And so there's very much this public recognition of that as a, of them as a fishing community that were there, and Bombay as a cluster of fishing islands before it became this big metropolis. So I think that has been used quite effectively um, by them, which is not to say that they are in a good place today, because I think uh, it definitely helps to avoid eviction. I don't think there's any question of them being evicted from the land um, at all. That is, but I think the real issues for them is about growth and expansion, and that's a real issue. I'll give you one simple example. In 1954, when they gave land to the BARC, the boundary wall was built, and so they talk about how that wall was built and how they said that at that time they didn't even have individual toilets inside the house. In, in the entire village, nobody had individual toilets, and so when uh, this land was taken, the boundary wall was placed so close to them without even a thought that they might need expansion or basic facilities like, say, latrines. So now, all along the boundary wall, I, I didn't show you, I have pictures of this, but you can actually see all these public toilets that have been built. Um, because they didn't even have space, you know, so they talk about the, the you know, the sort of um, indignity of, of how they had to manage because there was no space even to, for many houses, some of them. So that's why over the years they've um, built up. Um, and I think there, there's a little bit more question about how much can you build up? Uh, and because in many of these areas, the, you know, you're uh, going beyond building code. But villages also have their fishing villages have, I think, as I said, occupy a special place. So there's a number of ways. I mean, I, I, I can talk more about some of these. So we've looked at spatial modes. We've looked at institutional modalities. That are, they, they use a number of them. And they, they also work at different levels, which is really interesting, different scales. So for example, the strategy with senior bureaucrats is one, like writing letters, memos. So they have pretty detailed map going back to the 60s. And then they have local management of local level uh, you know, officers who come to inspect. Um, and so they manage local relations. And so that's how they do a combination of this. Another thing to think about is institutionally, the governance structure of the coast is very complex. There are, there are something like 15 or between 15 and 20 institutions, government institutions that control or govern the coast next to the Trombe Kodiwara. So they interact with about 15 different agencies. So I think in the spaces of this kind of, fra you know, this fragmented governance, they have also been able to work um, and sort of weave back and forth in between. So um, yes, that's a, oh sorry, you had one more question, right? I think, what was? Uh, their own governance of their own. Uh... Ah, yeah, no, no, that's a that's a really important question, and just I'll just briefly say for those of you who are familiar with Elena Ostrom's work um, and this idea of um, the governance of the commons, uh, there's been a lot of. Uh, I mean, so I think the fishing villages have this amazing uh, community governance system, the way, way in which they in fact govern their uh, common spaces. And these are held by different kinds of, so they have a fisher panchayat, which is not the same as a gram panchayat. It's a, it's a traditional caste panchayat, you can call it, or a traditional institution um, for the Koris, which administers common spaces. Um, and not just on land, but even in sea. So for example, they control the saj. And if there are disputes, for example, if a fisher gets caught, or if there's a fight between, so they do this both between Koriwaras, so if there's a fight between two villages, where one person says, oh, you infringed on my area, and you took my, you know, my those fish were mine, or that kind of thing, they will adjudicate but, uh, between the two villages. And within the village also, they adjudicate. Now, why is this not uh, you know, part of state law is another question. I think these are typically quite invisible and largely legible only within the fishing community. So everyone within the fishing community knows exactly where their boundaries are, and these are not marked or in some villages they are. So Trombe has some markings of where this is, but so they're not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, known, but neither is it also recognized at state level. Um, yeah. Thank you, that was uh, brilliant. 
so much to um, you know think about. I uh, my my name is Tampaka. I have a question, um, you know, which is stemming from my own research on public-private partnerships, large-scale infrastructure projects. And you started off your talk with large-scale infrastructure projects, which are sort of, you know, competing with um, with the sea and and amorphous boundaries that that the sea actually um, uh, offers. Um, my question is about um, any. Um, any any explorations you've uh, or investigations you've taken on uh, in in looking at the nature of uh, you know in in understanding the tensions that exist between two two very different forms of governance right when we're looking at these large scale infrastructure projects which are based on public private partnerships for instance they're defined on uh, the idea of a firm which has very very enclosed sort of boundaries and even there there are questions about uh, whether firms are porous or or bounded uh, entities. And then on the other hand, you have the space of the commons, which are also getting sort of squeezed, and they're becoming more like firms in a way because their boundaries are getting much more tightened up. Mm -hmm. um, so what kinds of you know, um, uh, tensions do we see between mm -hmm. these governance entities? Both are porous, perhaps, in, in their own ways, mm -hmm. but they're governed by very different logics. Mm -hmm. uh, have you explored any work on that front? Yeah, no, that's very much uh, ongoing, I think, work. It's a really important, I think, to think about that. And so thanks for the question. Um, I don't have any definitive answers. But one thing I will say is that definitely there is, um, let's say, bleeding between the two. Um, so you have this idea of private property, um, which the Koriwada never ascribed to or had within its settlement, but with the development of Mumbai, with the increased valuation of land, with the recognition that private legal ownership is the most important, it's valued much more than any kind of sacred relation or uh, any kind of um, uh, customary, uh, you know, uh, claim on a land. They know that all of those are secondary compared to the legal ownership. And, particularly legal by individual pri individual pro uh, property owner. So they're very much aware of this, and there's also a, lo a lot of um, interest in becoming private property owners. And there's a huge tension here between those who want private property ownership um, okay. at the household level, so that they can do what they want with their own houses, but at the settlement level, there are commons involved, and these need to be uh, governed by institutions within the community. So that very much is there. So we're seeing bleeding then between ideas of the commons and the, your, you, the way you talked about it as a firm, but equally one of property, one of contract, one of law. And that is something that there's a huge tension. What, what I'm seeing increasingly, though, is or what I would argue is that fishers then seek to recast this on their own terms. So they are interested in private property, but they want private property of a different kind. They want it to be governed by a community institution, but they want it legal. So they are no longer satisfied with customary, uh, because they know that something changes, the land gets more valued. Any minute it can be taken away from them. So yeah, we can talk more about that. Hi, I'm uh, Shivangi, and um, thank you so much for such an informative talk. I had a small question, and I'm really sorry if I missed it, but I was wondering if um, there are any sort of conflicts between the, the so-called migrants who are taking up their, or say, occupying their lands and the sea. So if you could share something conflicts about that. Conflicts between migrants and Migrants who? and the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. There are huge com conflicts. Um, uh, let's say it's a tense, it can be a tense um, relation at times, um, but it's also one of interdependence. So that's how I would uh, characterize it. Because as I said, there are different kinds of migrant communities there. So there are those who are the workers on the boats and they depend on each other. So for example, the fishing captain, that's the captain of the boat, the Tandale, he um, relies on a crew 
that's reliable. And often they come from the same village because they have to be 15 days at sea with very little entertainment. So usually they come from the same place, they know each other so they can live together in one boat and you know the conditions on these boats are not great so they have to do everything together. Um, so that's one kind of migrant community. And so as I said, there's interdependence but tension. For example, in many Koriwaras, including this one, migrant f workers in fishing have been agitating to become part of the fishing cooperative society. And the fishing cooperative societies are these, um, they're a community institution, but they, are a, they were formed at the behest of the state. So the state government in the, I think, early 60s or late 50s in Maharashtra, in fact, when, at the, when the idea of the cooperative was sort of very much a very strong concept, um, they, and also this idea of modernization of the fishing industry in the state. And so they, in fact, pushed the formation of fishing cooperative societies in every Koriwara in the state. And so you had these form, and they are basically like a bridge organization, and they, you know, communication, so there's knowledge of schemes, of technology support, of different kinds of subsidies that they might get. Uh, but what's also interesting is that they have become, in fact, the bastions also of different kinds of organization of the fishing community. So they have also managed to appropriate, and they are definitely, one can say that they have gone far beyond, a, they're certainly not a state-controlled uh, um, organization. So just, that was just an explanation of the fishing society, but migrants and workers have been agitating to become part, and the Koris have been resisting. Um, so that's one big example I can give you. And so the biggest tension is actually with workers, migrant workers in the fishing industry who are seen often as direct competitors. There's another big tension even in fish markets. Um, for example, this is largely given to us by women fishers who are the ones who handle all the credit, marketing, sales, all the investment side of fishing. Uh, and they are the ones, in fact, who are often will talk about uh, different co communities, North Indians or these, who have taken over selling and have displaced them or have pushed them out or competing with them. So that's another big. But outside of the fishing community, I think there's less tension and there is a significant amount of interdependence, especially through the rental relation. Yeah. Am I done? A big thank you to Lalita for this um, important account of a city, its relationship to water and the natural world, and most importantly, the lives and stories of the fisher, fishing communities. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming, and good night. I just wanted to just add quickly that um, I'm doing some new work for the last few years. We are developing a series of climate stories um, with two other colleagues of mine in Mumbai. And we are going to be launching some of these as stories. These are going to be multimedia stories uh, through a multimedia exhibition sometime in September, October. And it will be online. So those of you who are interested, do please uh, write to me. And uh, we will certainly make sure that we send you an email when the exhibition is launched. We'll also be holding a number of events related to it probably mostly in Mumbai, but maybe maybe one or two also in Bangalore. But uh, those who are interested do get in touch because I think uh, while Bangalore is not coastal and doesn't have fishing communities in the same way, um, I think this is a city of tanks uh, or lakes and I think wetlands of different sorts. Um, and I think there are people in the room who've done some of that work. But I think there are lots of very interesting overlaps um, and resonances. So. We'd love it if you get in touch. Um, so just to quickly end, and thank you for being such a great audience. <laughs> <laughs>